Good morning, everybody. There we go. Okay, well, welcome, welcome. Glad that you are here this morning. On the way in, hopefully you're able to grab a worship guide. You'll want that throughout the service. We'll have the, the order of service, the songs that we'll be singing, some sermon notes, some prayer points, and have some tear-outs for you. One thing that you can do is fill out the guest information form for us. Let us know who you are, where you're uh, visiting from, and how we can pray for you. You can rip that off and put it in the boxes before you leave. There's also another place for just prayer requests, so that's for anybody. And you can write on there if you have prayer requests for uh, just the, the elders of the church to pray for, or if it's everybody that you would like praying for your request. And again, you can put those in the boxes before you go. There's a, In the back, there is a, a chair out that has announcements and ongoing events. Just a few quick announcements I have for you. Vacation Bible School is coming up soon, so please talk with Tom and Shannon and Ezell if you are willing to volunteer. And do we still need boxes or are we going to box? Anything just perfectly square, cute, square boxes. If you have perfectly <laughs> cute boxes, then please bring those to Tom. Um, as you guys know, we will be uh, on pause with Kids Club and Sunday School um, starting here in June. And we do have a members meeting today directly after the service. So if you're a member of the church, please plan to stay and attend now. We have some things to talk about and vote on as a church. Uh, guests on your way, hopefully you're able to grab a guest packet. Those are outside for you. This tells you a little bit more about our church, who we are, and what we believe. So if you grab one of those, make sure you get one before you go. We have a library area over here with Bibles and various books to help you. We just put in three or four new books. So these are to help you in your walk with Jesus. And so go over here and uh, grab one of those after the service, especially if you do not have a Bible. Please make sure that you grab one before you leave. All right. I think that's all the announcements that I have for you right now, so we're going to transition to our worship service time. Can I have uh, those who are reading Scripture to please come forward? Normally what we do is we read an Old Testament passage and then a New Testament passage, but today we're actually going to read one psalm, and these men are going to divide that up and read it between them, and then Ed's going to pray for the service. So if you're able and willing, please stand and honor the reading of God's Word, and let's transition to our worship time. Reading Psalm 136, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love and forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love and endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for his steadfast love and endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders for his steadfast love and endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens for his steadfast love and endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters for his steadfast love and endures forever. To him who made the great lights for his steadfast love and endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for the sun's steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea to two, for his steadfast love endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and, it, and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To whom he him led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him, to him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. And kill mighty kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sion, Sion, who, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever. And rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again that we're able to meet Lord and worship you, Lord, and, and hear your word, Lord. We just uh, are so thankful that you 
loved us that you sent your only son to die for us for our salvation, Lord. We ask that you be us today in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Brother Billy, as he brings the word, Lord, and just watch over and protect us, Lord. And these things we ask in your name. Amen. 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 Let's sing together. I want to say it like this. Let's sing, He leadeth me for His steadfast love endures forever. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, the kind shepherd, found me. 
One of our elders here, Bill Jamie, is going to come forward and lead us through our corporate time of prayer. In your uh, worship guide, you'll see different points that you can pray during this time. A few things that I want to just put on your, your mind uh, when we have the time of silence for prayer. Uh, certainly, uh, Brother Perlin and Miss Chrissy, who are down, are up at Steve Hatchet. Uh, they, uh, he's become the pastor there, and so I want to continue to pray for them. Uh, also, Miss Jackie's family. Uh, we had the funeral yesterday for Miss Jackie Padgett, and it was, it was a great time of just remembrance and trusting and hoping in the Lord. And thank you for everyone who made meals and was a part of that. Uh, just pray for the families that are going through that time. And then, of course, with this being Memorial Day weekend, uh, for those of you who are here and others who have lost loved ones and, and serving our country and the freedoms that we have, we're thankful, of course, for their sacrifice and, and your sacrifice. And so be praying for peace for those during this time as well. Go ahead, brother. Our scripture reading this morning for our prayer time comes from Hebrews, Hebrews 4, starting in verse 14. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We lift up the things Pastor Billy mentioned. Uh, one thing we'd like to do here is recognize any of our visitors at home church that we can pray for. for that church and just pray for any of our churches in our area. They would all be gospel centered preaching and believing. Uh, churches. So any of our visitors today, would you like to share the name of your home church that we can pray for? The Crossings in Brandon, Florida.
God, we thank you for this day you've given us. God, we thank you for the opportunity that we can be together today, Lord, and praise and worship you. And hear your word, sing, read, preach today, Lord. Lord, I thank you for each and each and every person that's here today, Lord. And I lift up our visitors today in their churches. I pray that they would be Bible centered, gospel preaching churches, Lord. I pray for the saints in each of these churches as well as the leaders. God, I pray that. Uh, through these churches and our church as well, Lord, that the gospel would go forward to the unreached of the earth. Lord, I uh, pray that we would be faithful to uh, support our missionaries. Lord, uh, we look up today to one who doesn't know you yet, Lord, let today be the day of salvation. God, we pray that you would uh, be with Pastor Billy as he brings the message today. Give us ears to hear, Lord, and just let us apply your word today. So I pray that the remainder of this time is honoring and glorifying you. We love you because you first loved us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This week before uh, we stand to sing this song, I was going to tell you, I was thinking about the words of the song a little bit, and I kept thinking as I read through them, it's like, there's a lot of downers in this song. Listen to the verses, there's four verses. The first verse, Christ assures the anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn. Verse 2, while the tempest rages on, when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won. Verse 3, through the floods of unbelief. Verse 4, as we face the wave of death, when these trials give way to glory, as we draw our final breath. And through all the storms and the trials and the ordained suffering of God that we go through in our lives, it reminded me of the psalm that Brother Wayne and Brother Ed just read. They all, all those verses end in the same exact phrase. Verse 1, the anchor, it shall never be removed. Verse 2, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Verse 3, I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Verse 4, it's the same thing. I shall hold fast to the anchor, it will never be removed. So, when life comes our way, and these tragedies and trials and storms, when they come into our life, and they don't have the final say. We hold tight to the anchor because... Christ, the sure and steady anchor, he will never be removed. So let's stand and sing it together as a congregation. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, in the fury of the storm.
invite you to take your copy of God's inspired word and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you do not have a Bible with you today, there should be some pew Bibles in front of you. should be around page 238 in the pew Bibles. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Before we jump into the sermon today, I do want to uh, publicly praise the Lord and thank the Lord and thank Brother Tom for his faithfulness in opening up God's Word to you last week. If you walked away from his sermon last week and you do not understand what the gospel is or what your need for the gospel is, then you definitely fell asleep. You were not listening. And so, Brother, thank you for faithfully feeding the, the flock here and our guests the Word of God and the Gospel of Grace, and I praise God for you. As I was away meditating on 1 Samuel chapter 16 over in Scotland, I was asking the Lord to reveal to me what it is that we need to hear from this passage today. If you're not familiar with 1 Samuel, chapter 16 is a huge point in the story. It's a huge transitioning point in the story, and so a, a vital chapter to our understanding of 1 Samuel. For our guests who have not been here, we like to go through books of the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so we can understand in context what the meaning is in the passages and how to apply it to our lives. We ask the Holy Spirit to give us this insight on what it means and the Holy Spirit to help us to understand how this applies to our lives. The book of 1 Samuel or as our friends in Scotland would say, one Samuel. And what it is, is it's this transition from the judges of Israel, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. God was their king, and they had judges that would help rule over the people. And Samuel, the prophet, in 1 Samuel comes at a time when the transition is happening from those judges to the kings. Now, this wasn't actually a good thing in one sense because God's people were supposed to be satisfied with the fact that God was their king and that they were to be ruled by these judges, but they wanted to be like all the other nations around them. They wanted to look like the nations around them, and so God gave them exactly what they wanted. They wanted a king, and they wanted a human king, and they wanted a king that looked good to everybody else's eyes, good in the world's eyes, and he gave them that king. Congregation, what was the name of that king? Saul, King Saul. And we saw that there would be times that, that King Saul would, would seem to do things right, but th then we would see very quickly that the text would show us that he was not doing things truly from his heart. See, the, the driving force in Saul's life, and, and for some of you this is true of you as well, the driving force in Saul's life was what other people thought about him. What we call, what the Bible calls the fear of man or you could say the love of man, the love of praise. What do others think about me? And instead of what does the Lord think about me? And that was, that was Saul's major problem, is he was always worried about what others thought. Before I left, we were in chapter 15, and we saw that this is when the, the Lord kind of finally rejects Saul from being king. The Lord had made it clear that Saul was to lead God's people against the Amalekites who had attacked God's people hundreds of years before when they were coming out of Egypt. 
And God had said that he would bring judgment on the Amalekites for doing that to his people. And this was the time that it was supposed to happen. He said, Saul, you're to go in and you're to wipe them out. Everything that has breath, wipe them out. This is the command of the Lord. This was his judgment upon them. And Saul kind of obeyed. He obeyed most of it. But as we know, if you are obeying only when you want to, as far as the timing goes, or only to the degree that you want to, you're really not obeying. You're just really doing what you want to do with what you agree with. And that's not submitting to God. And so Saul did not obey the Lord. And the Lord said that he was grieved that he had made Saul king. And so Samuel was sent and he tells Saul that the kingdom is being torn away from you. In that, in that moment just before, as Samuel was walking away, Saul had gotten down and reached out for Samuel's robe and it tore. And he said, just like that, God is taking the kingdom from you because you are not faithful. And he's going to give it to a neighbor of yours who's a better man than you are. Saul didn't seem to understand these things well. And he said, well, just, just please, at least, at least come back with me, Samuel, and make sure I look good in front of all the people. And for whatever reason, Samuel at least did that, because Samuel, I do believe, did love Saul. He really wanted it to work out. He wanted Saul to be the king that he was supposed to be. But he would continually fail. One of his biggest failures was indeed leaving the king of the Amalekites, Agag, alive. And at the end of chapter 15, we saw that Samuel then calls King Agag forward. And as the text says... He hacked him up and finished the job that the king would not do. The end of chapter 15, verse 35 says this, And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted or was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. And that's where we left off. And now it's this pivotal moment, this change in the story, the the passing on to the next king. Let me read through the text, 1 Samuel chapter 16. You can follow along silently, and then we'll work through and see what the Lord has for us today. 1 Samuel chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse... For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, "Uh, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. 
And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Verse 14, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a a son of Jesse from Bethlehem who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and skin and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service and Saul loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David remain in my service for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Okay. As I was reading through the text, certainly different things were coming out, and that last part there we'll get to on what is going on with the the music here. But some time has passed now. Samuel was grieved over Saul. And now in verse 1, the Lord now speaks again to Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I've rejected him from being king over Israel? The Lord speaks to him and says, you're grieving, you're down, you're not moving on with your ministry, and it's time to move. How long are you going to stay this way? Samuel, I've rejected him. Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. First thing I want to show you guys today. Look at what happens. He's grieving and it's good to grieve. It's it's good to grieve when those who are in, in positions of authority that God has raised up, when they fall, it is good to grieve that. Many of you have heard of pastors or seen pastors that fall and the thud that happens after they fall is big. Amen? I do believe, again, that Samuel loved Saul. He hoped it would work out. But Saul was also the king of God's people. And so he's grieving about this. But this was still the Lord's plan. We saw in the previous chapter that, that yes, although we're seeing that they're making choices and they want this king and that king, there is still just plan A with God. You guys know that, right? There's no like plan A, oh man, that didn't work. It wasn't like, like all the way back in the garden, when God created everything, he has Adam and Eve, and there's no sin, everything is great. And then when they sin, it's not like God went, oh man, I totally didn't see that coming. Oh, what's plan B? I don't know. Holy Spirit, what are your thoughts? Son of God, the triune God talking, I don't know. What should we do? Oh, maybe we should, oh, could we redeem the people somehow? That's not how it happens. There is still God's sovereign plan taking place, and we see different things happening all around. So he says, well, how long are you going to grieve, Samuel? Fill your horn with oil and go. Friends, it's good to grieve. Some of you in here right now, you grieve the life that you have. Some of you wish that life would have looked differently. Some of you have been divorced. Some of you have lost spouses. You say, I wish it would have been different. Some of you had, had jobs and aspirations, things that you were hoping to do, and life has not turned out as you hoped. Quick show of hands, especially you younger ones, take a look at this for a moment. Watch the hands that I think will go up here. How many of you would say life has not really turned out as you thought it would? Show of hands. Young ones, take a look around. Life seldom turns out like we think it's going to. Here's the encouragement from this first part of the text. 
grieve it, give it over to the Lord, and move on. Get back to what he has called you to. Samuel, you're grieving. How long are you going to keep doing this? It's time to fill your horn, horn with oil because he needs to go. He needs to anoint the next king. That's the next thing. So friends, again, grieve what's happened. Fill the horn with oil and move on to the next thing. Okay, some of you need that today. Now notice at, at the end there, God says, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Not just I'm, I'm gonna give them the one that the people wanted. Now I'm giving you the king after my own heart, the king from my own heart. Now I'm gonna give them my king instead of the one that they wanted, that he chose for them. Notice it mentions Jesse here. For those of you who read through the Bible, if you are reading through the book of Ruth, which if you just go back a couple pages to the left in your Bible, just before 1 Samuel is the book of Ruth. It's a book that some of you have studied. I've preached through the book of Ruth before. And it goes through, and it has the story of Ruth and Boaz and how God works in just these incredible ways in his providence to make sure that this, this line continues from Boaz. And if you look at Ruth chapter 4, as the, the story ends, Ruth ends up getting married. Again, her husband had died. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, is with her. She marries Boaz. And now Naomi gets to, gets to have a grandchild here. And some of you are familiar with the story, but let me just read Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi, which it's actually Ruth's son, but Naomi was the grandma, and so she's like, hey, that's my grandson. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then it ends with the genealogy here. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fa fathered Hezron, and Hezron fathered Ram, and Ram fathered Amenadab, and Amenadab fathered Nashon, and Nashon fathered Solomon, and Solomon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. You should have been reading Ruth. You should have got to the end of the book of Ruth and said, Jesse fathered David. Great. Right? Now, we have a little more in our minds from the New Testament and more explanation, but if you were just reading through, you would have said, okay, well, David must be somebody. And then you'd get to 1 Samuel, and he wouldn't pop up immediately. You'd be seeing Samuel, and you'd be seeing this guy Saul. And then you'd get to chapter 16, and you'd see the name Jesse. You go, wait, I've heard that name before. I've heard that name before. You see, Ruth was set during that time of the judges, and this is transitioning to the kings. So we now see that he's being sent to Jesse, and our mind should be going, oh, wait, Jesse, there was something important about him. It was just that he had David. <laughs> I wonder who David is. Let's continue. So right when Samuel's told, hey, get, you need to grieve and you need to go, get your horn full of oil, it's time to go, Samuel says, well, how can I go? If Saul hears, he'll kill me. Uh-oh, Samuel's having a little bit of issue there, isn't he? We haven't seen that with him. A little bit of fear, which makes sense. I mean, he's supposed to go and what's he going to do with that oil? He's going to anoint the what? The next king. You, most kings are pretty happy if you just take away their power. Pretty much how it works, right? Everyone's really comfortable, for the most part, just giving away their power to somebody else. So he's like, uh, Lord, <laughs> if I go, I've got to pass right through Saul's town to get there. You want me to go? Uh. And the Lord knows that he obviously wants to obey here. So the Lord says, no, no, here. You're going to take a heifer and you're going to say that you're going to go down and sacrifice. Now, he's not lying. He's really going to go down and sacrifice, but this gives him a way, a reason to get there because it's not time for the new king to be known yet to everybody. So Saul doesn't need to know yet. So he says, when you go to town, then you're going to invite Jesse to the sacrifice and then I will show you what to do. I, I think if it were me, I'd be like, can I have a few more details? <laughs> can I know a little bit? Is that you sometimes, right, Lord? Lord, I know what you want me to do, but can I have a few more details? How's this going to work out? I want you to move to this city and go and, and, and serve on staff, Tom. Go, take your family and go. Okay, Lord, can I have a few more details? No, just go. All right. Many of you have had this. Where you know the Lord is directing you, but then it's like, but I would really like to know more. The Lord says, 
I'll tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. And that really ultimately comes down to trust. Do you trust him? Same would be if you had a human example, if somebody was telling you maybe directions on how to do something or where to get somewhere, and they were telling you some things. If you really trusted them, they would tell you up to a point and you would listen. But usually we say, I want to know everything. Give me all the details. That's actually just a control issue you have, just so you know. Lack of trust and control issues. And you shall, verse 3, and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare. Samuel talks to God about it, and then watch what verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord commanded. He didn't get everything that he wanted, he didn't get all the details, but he did what the Lord commanded. Where we kept seeing with Saul, he wouldn't do what the Lord commanded, at least not fully. So he comes to Bethlehem, and now as he arrives in Bethlehem, the elders of the city come and they're trembling. Right? They come out, here comes Samuel, oh no. Especially, it sounds like maybe like word of him hacking up the, former, the king of the Amalekites may have gotten out. Like, oh, or... They know that he's a prophet and maybe his job, they know that he's broken off from Saul. He doesn't have a good relationship with Saul anymore. So, oh, he's coming to town. So they kind of come up. You can see they're trembling. Do you come in peace? Yeah, I come in peace. I'm just coming to make a sacrifice. Oh, okay, okay. Whew. We're nervous here. So he says, consecrate yourselves. Get yourselves ready for the sacrifice, part of the, the rituals that they would do. And he consecrated Jesse in verse 5 and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And now we're going to start to see that the sons are going to come through. And he looks and he sees this Eliab and he goes, Ah, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. This is the guy. Must be. And verse 7 is such a key verse to understanding all of Scripture, really. But the Lord said to Samuel in verse 7, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Man, we do that all the time. We do that all the time. We're always looking, and we only see on the outside. The Lord sees directly to the heart. It's interesting that even Samuel's kind of like, oh, this must be the guy because he's really tall, really handsome. He must be the guy. Friends, those of you who've been here, as we've gone through the first 15 chapters, what was it about Saul that drew everybody to him? He was taller than everybody else. He was the Hebrew hunk. He looked really good. And even Samuel's going, it must be this guy because he looks good how quickly we fall back into these things. The Lord sees the heart. He sees past the fake facade that exists in others and in your life as well. The facade that you put on to look good in front of everybody else out of fear of man or love of man, love of praise, that facade you put on, God sees right through it. He cares about the heart. So it's not him. So now we're going to see some of the other sons come through in verse 8 and verse 9. The Lord says it's not them either. So Jesse makes a seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And so it's like, no, it's none of these guys. So now Samuel's like, huh, this doesn't work. They're your sons. They're supposed to come and anoint one of your sons. And Wait a second. Jesse, are all your sons here? Oh, well, no. There's the youngest one, the skinnier guy over there. He's actually out with the sheep. We didn't even bother inviting him in because surely it was going to be one of these other seven, probably the first one, but not, not that one, not the youngest one that's out there with the sheep. That's not, who, that's not who God would choose. And Samuel's like, well, I've been dealing with God for a while. <laughs> you need to call your son. We ain't doing another thing until he comes in. Verse 12, it's not that David was ugly by any means. He's just the youngest and smallest. But he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. So, hey, ladies, if you're here, you're looking for somebody, the Lord, he looks at the heart. But that doesn't mean you have to find an ugly guy. 
You don't have to like, don't like go around and go, all right, who's the ugliest guy around? That's the one, obviously, because he's going to have a good heart. That doesn't match up. It's not like the more attractive you are, the worse your heart is, or the other way around. That's not how it goes, okay? It's the heart that matters. However, if you can find the double whammy of the good-looking guy who's got a great heart, well, marry him. (laughs) Same thing for you guys with ladies. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is God's king. Not the one the people wanted. This is God's king. Coming in from the, the field, the youngest, the shepherd. That's my guy right there. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Now watch this. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went up to Ramah. God anoints him, and now the Spirit of God has come to equip him to do what God is going to call him to do. Especially in the Old Testament, but it, even, it's even true in the New Testament, that God will equip you to do what he calls you to do. He's not going to say, you need to do this, and so good luck. He equips you to be able to do what he calls you to, especially by his spirit. He call, he's calling David into this service and his spirit is going to be with him moving forward. The same is true for you. If you're a believer, a follower of Christ, you've trusted in Jesus' death and his resurrection, you are given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. And you are gifted by that spirit to serve God. He equips you and calls you to various services. Many of you right now are not walking in areas of where you should be as far as serving God because you're either scared or distracted. You need to hear that the Lord is with you and he has equipped you to be able to serve him in whatever he would call you to. Now, right as we see the Spirit is coming on David, we flip back over to Saul's story. And that's going to happen throughout the remaining chapters. We're going to see stuff with David. We're going to see stuff with Saul. David, Saul, we're going to see Saul kind of goes out of the picture, and David grows and grows. Now, the Spirit of the Lord comes on David. Now look what verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. God's Spirit was with Saul, but he still would not obey God. And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. When you first read that, you go, ooh, I'm not so sure I like that. Reminder, the Lord is absolutely sovereign over everything that exists. This is his judgment on Saul for Saul's disobedience. And the Lord can use whatever he wants to bring his judgment. He uses other nations against Israel. He can use spirits over different people. He does whatever he pleases. And what's incredible is even though he's sovereign, we were talking about this in Sunday school, even though he is sovereignly working, there are still independent choices that are being made. And those evil choices by kings, nations, or even spirits are their own choices. But yet God is somehow working all things to his end. So the Lord has sent this harmful spirit to torment Saul as his judgment upon him. Now what's remarkable is, watch this, and Saul's servants said to him, behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Is that like, what does that look like? He's being tormented, and everyone goes, yep, it's a spirit from the Lord. Like this, it's just written in such a way that it's just like common knowledge. Verse 16, let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre, And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play and you will be well. Obviously. We all know how that works. When there's a harmful spirit upon you, play a little stringed instrument and obviously it'll go away. We all know that. When I was reading through, I'm going, where is this coming from? So Saul says to his servants, hey, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. Great idea. Verse 18, one of the young men answered, "Uh, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse. Oh, what a coincidence. Isn't that just remarkable? Of all the people, I know this one guy. 
Jesse's son. He's very skillful in playing. He's actually a man of valor, prudent in speech, a man of war, a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Isn't that interesting how he's defined? The Lord's with this guy. So you want the, the guy who the Lord is with to come and play the instrument so the spirit from the Lord will leave you. <laughs> That's tormenting you. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who's with the sheep. David's been anointed and he is still serving with the sheep. He's preparing to lead God's people. If you don't know how to be faithful in the things God's called you to, he's not going to give you more. If you're not faithful to being... You, in your own walk with Christ, if you're not faithful with your, your wife or your husband, if you're not faithful in raising up your kids, he's not going to give you more. David is continuing to be faithful. He says, send me David, your son. And so Jesse, his dad, took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them to David, or sent them by David to Saul. And so David comes in and he comes and he enters into his service. And Saul, watch this, loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. David becomes Saul's armor bearer, which is like the guy who's with him all the time. David, the guy who's supposed to take his place, is now the armor bearer, and Saul loved him greatly. And Saul sent a message to Jesse saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. And so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Friends, some observations I have for you from the text. Some we've said, some we haven't yet. The first one is, God, as you see, is choosing the king from his own heart. His plan is coming about. The second one is God does not judge on the outward appearance, but he judges the heart. The third thing I have for you is many times God will use those who are broken down or the least in the world's eyes to bring himself the most glory. If you are here and you think, man, I am just broken. There's no way God could use me. I am broken. I'm the least among my friends, among my family. There's no way God could do something really through me. He loves working with people like you. He loves working with people like me. Broken people he uses for his glory. So if you're in a spot there, I pray that you will trust and take steps forward in obeying God with what he has for you. Like I said before, God will give you what you need for the task he's called you to. You need to grieve over certain things and you need to move forward doing whatever he has called you to do. You have to keep pushing forward. Don't stop. A little rest might be okay. Keep being faithful. God's spirit is with us, as you see with David, and guess what? He leads us to the best place to be, but it's not always the safest place. Think about this. He takes David. This is the plan. David, we're going to make you king. You're going to replace Saul. And so what I want you to do is I want you to go and live next to the king whose throne you're going to take from him. When we would go overseas, people would say, oh, we just want you to be in God's will. That's the safest place for you. No, not always. God's will is the best place for you. But humanly speaking, bodily speaking, Biblically, not necessarily the safest place. A side note here, I do think that this text shows us that we do need to pay attention to music. It's remarkable of what's going on here in this, in this passage. And I was talking with someone this week, actually Heather and I were talking, and we were out uh, for our anniversary and a song came on that neither one of us had heard in about 20 years. And we both could start singing it immediately. You ever have that? Don't you wish you could do that with the Bible? right? So people are like, oh, I can't memorize anything. My mind just doesn't work that way. Song comes on, oh, they start singing every word. 
the music side. There seems to be something here. So let me just encourage you to think on that. Pray on that. What are you allowing in music-wise? Are you bringing in things that will help encourage you and, and push away false beliefs and false ideas? Or are you just adding more in there? Something to consider. I don't know. So discuss that over lunch. Parents, what are you letting your kids listen to? Do we even care? Things to think about. And of course, we see in this passage that God is sovereignly working throughout. It's interesting in the flow of things. The spirit comes on David. The spirit leaves Saul. But then he gets a harmful spirit. The next thing is that the, the servants realize that it's a harmful spirit from God. So the next thing they say is, hey, you need to tell us to go find you someone. Then the next thing is, Saul says, all right, go find someone. Then somebody goes, oh, wait, I know someone. And this happens to be David. So they go get David and David comes. All these things God providentially working to get David right next to Saul. What if David never learned to play the lyre? <laughs> Something that he's done in his life that God wants to use for his glory prepared him to go to be in a dangerous place but at the center of God's will think about those things what I want to end with is there is a connection or many connections in this passage to Christ David is now the king that God has provided David is nothing but a pointer to the true king that God has provided for himself Jesus David points to he's a type of king and that's fulfilled in Jesus. God's Spirit comes on David so he can do what he's supposed to do. Jesus' baptism, the heavens open up, and the Spirit descends upon Jesus like a what? Dove. And Jesus' ministry is empowered by the Spirit. Jesus, his whole life, did the Father's will perfectly. He said it's his food to do what the Father commands. So David's now there in a dangerous spot, but he's at the center of God's will. Well, the same is true for Jesus. Jesus is at the center of God's will. He was at the center of God's will for us, and that meant great danger for him in the sense of he was murdered on a cross. That's pretty dangerous. But it also meant great deliverance for us. The center of God's will was to crush his son for us. We've got to be very careful, friends, when we look as man sees, whether that's at people or situations, and we say, this is how it should go. We want to have our minds renewed by the Spirit and the Word so we can see things as God sees. None of us would have wrote the story that God's Son comes to die for rebels, for enemies of God to save us because we can't save ourselves. That's not the story we would have written. You want to know what story we would write? Look at every other religion that exists. It's that we do stuff to please God, to get to God. That's the story we write. God doesn't look that way. He doesn't see things that way. His story is, you can't do anything on your own. I need to do it for you. Friends, that is something to rejoice about. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for this passage, Lord, and we're thankful for the fact that you've worked in history and you have you've removed Saul and you're bringing in King David. We're thankful that, that David has come because ultimately Jesus comes from David's line. The true king who reigns forever. That promise you end up making to David that there'll be one from David's line who will be on the throne forever. The, the true king, the one who's perfect, the one who's, where your spirit has been on him and he obeys you perfectly because we couldn't. And Lord, that you worked in such a way, Jesus, that you would be in the center of God's will, a dangerous place, but the perfect place to rescue us because your steadfast love endures forever. Lord, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. and you are in good standing with your church. You are welcome to take the Lord's Supper with us. Uh, but 
If, if you are not a Christian, then this is not for you to take. This is actually something to observe because we do this as a proclamation and a remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. So if you're not a Christian, just observe during this time. Uh, if you are a Christian, this is the time where you would just take a few moments, ask the Lord to search your heart, maybe some of the things you heard in the sermon or the songs or the scripture reading, and, and repent of anything that you need to repent of, and then you'll take this as a celebration for our Lord. So take just a few minutes now and ask the Lord to search your heart while we prepare things up here. Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not... Be condemned along with the world. So then, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, will not be for judgment. About other, the other things, I will give directions when I come. So again, that's why we give you those few moments there to ask the Lord to search your heart before taking Lord's Supper. So as you come forward, again, this is a time of celebration, so come forward and just eat and take and eat of the, the Lord here. And we're proclaiming the Lord's death, but also while you're waiting for your turn, feel free to read Scripture over the congregations people are coming. Forward, you're waiting your turn. Okay, you guys come here. And we do have some gluten free if anybody needs that. Just let us know.
worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. And wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And one of the elders said to me, Do not see the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and Christ. He was able to open the scroll and it set the seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, and serving on the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which were the seven spirits of God, sent out into the earth. He came and took the scroll, with the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a heart, and they were holding gold and gold full of incense. Prayer of the saints. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain with your blood and purchased men for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests and to serve our God, and they will reign on the throne forever. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand and respond with the sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy I'm going to pray in just a second as you're dismissed. And if those who have little ones in the nursery would actually go first and grab your kiddos and then go through the line so that way the rest of us can go through. But we do need to go through the nursery. So go get your kids, go through the line, and then the rest of us will come. Uh, we do have, uh, again, a place for you to give if you feel led to do that today or drop off your guest information form for your prayer requests. And don't forget the library. There is no financial class tonight. There is no Bible study tonight as well because we're having our members meeting. So let me go ahead and pray for us, uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we do thank you again for our time together. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. Lord, we're thankful for the service that we've had today. Lord, we pray that it's been pleasing to you, Lord, and encouraging and uplifting and edifying and convicting to each one of us, Lord. We pray as, as we uh, depart from here, Lord, that those going over to the meal and the membership, uh, the members class, Lord, would be um, of like mind and unified, Lord, and that you bless the food to our bodies. For our friends who are heading uh, away from us, we pray for safe travels for them, Lord, and that you bring us all back together again soon. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day, everybody.